Yeah, the SDM Alien Baby that you brought up had uh, several uh, BA roles. And like you had the business analyst, the business advisor, and the business ambassador. I was just wondering, is that not a lot, a very similar role? How do those roles break down, please? Okay, it's a very good question. There are those three business side roles um, and very different responsibilities there. Um, the business ambassador is the real business person, end user, empowered on behalf of an area of the business to actually say, this is how we will create these screens, create this product, this is what it will look like. That saves us the, the problem that, let's say you're building a call centre system and there are 150 people in the call centre, you know, who's the one person we listen to? Okay, and it's a business choice, who's the right person to represent that peer group? The business advisors can be anyone that we bring in, either for specialist information or for um, review. Um, a business ambassador will not just make all the decisions on their own, they will take things out to the business advisors, but it's to clarify <coughs> who are the opinions and who's the decision maker. Now, for a long time with DSDM, there were just those two roles, and it's really to make that clarification of, we, we do need one voice of truth to listen to, okay, and that's someone who management have actually empowered for this project to be the spokesperson. But it was found that with developers and the business ambassador working very closely together, there was a missing skill because while the business know what they do now, they may not have the analysis techniques to join that to what other areas do and to look towards the future as well. They haven't got the, the business analysis techniques, the value chain analysis, etc. So the business analyst role was brought in specifically to a turn, which is the latest version, to, to cover that, but not to sit between the developer and the users, to sit as a part of that triumvirate, as it were, of developer, <coughs> business ambassador, and, which is the other one? Business ambassador, developer, and business analyst, yeah? And also there is, in the, in the picture, there's, there's another role, which is tester, who also sits in that, so it's actually, uh, I've now drawn you a four-sided triangle. Maybe that's a pyramid, I'm not sure, um, to deal with that. So it's the team working together, but to bring in that skill of analysis and non-silo thinking looking across the board. Any others? How am I on time, Katie? Uh, we're okay. Yeah? Straight across that way. I work within a reasonably large UK company. We've got a, an IT department of around 2,000, 2,200. Um, what the development arm of the IT department, which is only about 14, 1,500 people, has gone agile. Other areas, architecture, about 300 people hasn't. Um, so we still go through almost a farce of having upfront requirements, design, and then into Agile. How do we encourage to move away from that, and how should we move away from that? Okay, um, that is something that frequently does happen. You'll be pleased to know you're not alone, although pleased perhaps isn't what you'll be with sometimes the results. Very often the, the infrastructure side of things doesn't go Agile, and the the sort of business as usual, the, pass the service transition over into business as usual um, is passing into a very non-agile area. One of the things that we recommend, um, and at some point in the future, um, you may see the, um, the alien baby having an extra arm, um, is the bringing of a, a release manager, an operations coordinator, whatever you want to call them, into the team, and that the spreading of that idea into not just the development area, you've seen it spreading out into the business, we do, do need to spread it into how this is going to be maintained in the future, what infrastructure it's going on to, etc. So these skills do need to be represented um, as part of that team, otherwise we do end up with an, an agility with a lot of concrete around it. Hi. Um, thinking about the qualifications, uh, it always sort of worries me when I see an agile qualification. How, um, 
how do you prevent people from learning or how to pass an agile, an agile exam rather than being in an agile mindset? How's that been achieved? Okay, there is a, a very large proportion of the agile community, um, and probably the community at large, but I have experienced the agile community in this, that do feel that um, if you pass a qualification, it does not mean you are agile. And actually, I would agree with that. I don't think the qualification proves you're agile, but I think it measures a certain level. If you take your medical qualifications, it doesn't mean you're a good doctor, but I'd probably trust you more than someone who hadn't done any medical qualifications. So I think it tells us something. It, it kind of cuts away from the, the end of, it probably means you're not completely unknowledgeable and completely incompetent. It doesn't necessarily guarantee total competence. So I think employers probably are aware of this because we work with qualification all of the time. You know, someone who passes a, a maths GCSE probably knew something in order to do that. So as long as we don't take that further and say, therefore, they're Einstein, I think we're fine. But I think it is something we do have to watch. Does that answer the question? Yeah? OK. OK, anything further? Just looking at a lot of the values in the um, some of the previous slides, how does this differ from lean thinking? Okay, um, you will have noticed that the um, in the set of approaches that I put up there, um, lean is one of the aspects or one of the approaches that people will consider to be agile. So in that respect, a lot of the values that are in there are in there in lean, are in there in DSDM, are in there in Scrum, feature driven de development, Crystal. The same, the same values. I mean, you, you're possibly aware of the Agile Manifesto? Um, and again, you know, anyone who isn't, um, Google Agile Manifesto, or one word, and it will take you to um, a website, which is agilemanifesto.org, and, and there's a lot of information on there. And that was put together in 2001 by people from, again, all over the world, and different backgrounds, DSDM, Scrum, um, to some extent lean, because the people who are most behind lean in a software world, people like um, Tom and Mary Poppendick, um, were involved with the people that did that. I'm not too sure that they were, they were initial signatories, but they were very soon after. Um, so all of these ideas brought from all across the world were a group of people who'd been talking to each other and saying there are better ways of delivering projects and delivering software via projects than we had been doing. We do need to be on time and on budget, but we need a sustainable pace. We need a way of working that lets us give, have access to the right skills. And all of the approaches were saying those things. Now, where uh, the approaches themselves differ is they have different levels of rigor, different levels of basically write-up of what the, the approach is, different levels of framework. And with Lean, there are a lot of ideas that are shared with Agile. There isn't such a strong framework as there would be with, say, something like DSDM, although there is, you know, there is a way forward. And if you look at um, Mary and Tom Poppendick's book, that's probably one of the best sources to, to start on that. Just so that we can keep to time, can, can we sort of stop our questions there? I'm sure Doc will happily answer uh, any other questions as, as we go through the day. Um, what I'd uh, just like to thank Doc very much for that. Thank you. Thank you.